We have a new administration, which is, by common consent, off to the wildest start we have ever seen. We are less than six months in, and we already have a special counsel. And that is uh, usually something that happens in the second term of a two-term presidency in the past. Uh, we have a new president who is uh, very adept at using the social media. Twitter has become his way of communicating, especially with his base, but also with the wider world. Now, this is not brand new, because in the days of radio, Franklin Roosevelt, who was very adept at radio, used that as a way to go over the heads of the press and talk directly with the people. Nothing really wrong with that, but there's been sizable controversies uh, with Twitter. And, those, and not only uh, with using that, but in fact, uh, our new president has fired the head of the FBI who was conducting an investigation into the possibilities of Russian hacking during the election, separate from possible collusion with Russia on the part of some people in the Trump campaign. And that has kept uh, our, our uh, senior senators and congressmen, such as the Honorable Don Bonker, who is with us, his, his colleagues and former colleagues on the Hill, uh, working away uh, in overdrive. Again, it's very early in an administration. Meanwhile, uh, not everyone is happy uh, on the other side. I was at a conference with Hillary Clinton two and a half weeks ago in which she talked about the election. And it was an interesting full-throated conference. For those of you who might want to see it, it's on the Recode uh, technical uh, tech conference uh, held in California. And in it, she goes over the reasons why she lost. And like President Trump, in one respect, she is not a big fan of former FBI Director James Comey, who was doing an investigation of, uh, of her homemade e uh, email server and uh, at one point had come out in the summer and said Secretary Clinton had been extremely negligent with it but had not gone over the line and broken a law. That made Donald Trump mad at him. But then a few days before the election, more emails were found, this time on her assistant Huma Abedin's computer, and Comey investigated those, and she felt that that, in fact, had stopped her momentum. Furthermore, she said, and it was interesting to hear a number put to it, she said 1,000 Russian agents had been pumping out other news uh, about her into, we've had many, much talk about fake news, but the ways in which that's done in sending out stories and then training bots, robots, in effect, uh, to spread that even further around. She thought that had been a major factor. So one of the things that is the net result of this, when you talk about the 500 years of news, a great deal of the future of news is really being played out right now in Washington. And we had at the museum, uh, where I'm vice chair, and I'll tell you a little about that, uh, in a minute, we had a big conference called the Press and the Presidency at 100 Days. And I will go into a few elements uh, that emerged that I think might be of interest to people who are following uh, the American political situation, because it has turned out to be, as near as we can tell, in this uh, hyper-connected but also much divided world, the most talked about man in the world is Donald Trump. And the museum was set up, uh, it opened nine years ago, and each of you is invited if you come to Washington, D.C. I know some of you have been there before, but it is a temple of the First Amendment. The First Amendment, a unique American idea uh, over 200 plus years ago at the, at the birth of the, of the country to amend the Constitution to allow five things, that government should not abridge freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, 
and the right to peaceably assemble, which we see in our demonstrations, peaceably assemble to seek redress of grievance from the government. And that's, that's the lobbyists. So in fact, America was set up to be a marketplace of ideas. And the marketplace of ideas meant that every faction and every person could have his or her voice heard. There's nothing wrong with being lobbyists, although they are sometimes, uh, sometimes scorned in some of the public dialogue. But in fact, that's what America was set up for. Let every voice be heard. Let the marketplace of ideas work so you have an argument culture. And out of that will come a set of consensuses that, even though they may be changed, will give people a sense that I have been heard in a democratic way. Right now, we are at, a, at a, an interesting point in which you could view the election of Donald Trump as a way of saying that consensus hasn't been delivering for a lot of Americans. This is part of the populist idea, which we've seen in other countries. And he, for his supporters, was sent to turn the tables over in Washington. So those supporters say often that we in Washington, who are used to particular norms and the way a president works, are are in old thinking. And in fact, uh, one of the most uh, prominent American newsmen came to our press and the presidency summit. Uh, and for that, I should mention, we got 400 million impressions around the world. It was one of them, it is by far the biggest event we have had. And it shows the amount of interest that there is not only in this presidency, but in the relationship of the press because, lest we forget, uh, Donald Trump often puts uh, out, in, when he writes about the New York Times, he put, calls it the failing New York Times, even though when he met with them, he called them a jewel. And he has also uh, called uh, people in the press uh, the, worst, the worst people in the world. And yet, um, I should, uh, perhaps offer a small translation there. I have known Donald Trump a bit over many years, only professionally. Uh, and in fact, if there is anyone who likes good press coverage, it's Donald Trump, uh, which if you read about his years as a builder and as a social man about town in Manhattan, uh, he very much appreciates that. So. It, even though he will call the New York Times failing, he also calls up Maggie Haberman, the reporter who covers him. So there is a push and pull, uh, a back and forth, that in interesting ways uh, sometimes reflects the attitudes of many Americans toward the press. There have been surveys in the past which will mention, do you trust the press? Not so much in the aggregate. Do you trust your hometown newspaper? much higher. So it is always important, I, I mentioned this dealing with all polls, uh, to be careful of, uh, of what broad general questions uh, may result in. When you get down to specifics, you may get a different answer. At the Press and the Presidency Summit, Bob Schieffer, who is a very prominent American newsman who's covered 14 campaigns, said that in his view, Hillary Clinton uh, was playing by the old rules. Uh, a, an interview with her was hard to get. Access to her was restricted. Donald Trump, running an outsider campaign, gave many interviews. He would phone in. He would talk at the drop of a hat. He turned out to be a very good television performer because of his much-mocked show, uh, the, uh, the Apprentice and the Celebrity Apprentice, that was mocked by the Politico, saying, oh, well, that's just a reality show. But it turns out he had learned very well how to play the part of the tough but fair boss. And by having that and using Twitter and social media and he has a strong social media group under him, 
he was able to reach a part of the electorate that the pollsters got less of. And that was another of the, of the rules of the 2016 election. Virtually every pollster was wrong. And part of that was, in retrospect, it looks like that some elements of the electorate did not want to talk to pollsters. They were part of this establishment that Donald Trump was there to, to upend and overrule. Uh, I can't help but mention that, uh, for those of you who are uh, deeply interested in politics, there was one outlet that did get the polling right, and it was my old newspaper, the Los Angeles Times. And the reason was they did a very different method they decided to get 3,500 people and stay with them for over a year, interviewing parts of them so that they could see the change in sentiment rather than the usual business, which is to get roughly 1,200 for a national poll, but it's a different 1,200 and you try to weight them by dem demography, age, and socioeconomic status. That, that latter method was the one that got everything skewed. The LA Times got it right. And in fact, uh, I told uh, some bright young women at the office at the museum who were going home on election night, and they were wearing their Hillary t-shirts and they're very happy. And I said, I, said, I, just, I just wanna raise one thing in the contrarian way, because in newspapers you are always taught, take a look at the opposite of whatever you are told. Take a look just in case it, the conventional wisdom could be wrong. I said, did you see the movie The Big Short, which was about stock traders? There were only a few, but there were a few who got the crash of 2008 right. They were shorting the market in housing. And it's an amazing movie. I recommend it because I believe it's now available either in DVD or on uh, services because it is a study of four guys who went against the grain. And in fact, uh, they, uh, the contrarian did happen. So Bob Schieffer said that the, that the old rules versus the new rules were extremely important and that Donald Trump has rewritten political rules, probably for everyone, as you heard in Giles's very good uh, uh, talk, the element of having much more interactive Facebook and other material uh, help the labor people. Uh, another person who spoke at our press and the presidency summit uh, was David Farenthold. And David Farenthold had just won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative journalism. And he again represents something new in the social media age. That is, most investigative reporters, when I was editor of the Los Angeles Times, were uh, stereotyping a little bit. Many of them were like pack rats. They were getting their secret. They were going out. They wanted to be sure that people weren't catching on to their approach to things. And it was a justifiable caution. So in the law of inverse, David Farenthold decided to tell everybody what he was looking for when he investigated Donald Trump's charities. And the question was, what had the money uh, for the charities been spent on? And he had a very good lead that in one case, the money had been spent on a very uh, important looking portrait of Donald Trump. So instead of hiding this, he goes on his uh, Twitter account and other social media and says, can anybody help me find <laughs> Donald Trump's portrait? And I, as I recall, several hundred people replied. One woman went on Yelp, which, uh, which uh, gives uh, reports on hotels and other places and and looked several in several hundred places in Trump hotels and found where she thought it was in a in a hotel as I recall in Florida another of his legion of irregulars uh, then sa said he would go to that hotel using his points and he got there and he couldn't find it and then 
he spent the night going around talking to the people who worked in the hotel, found, as I recall, um, a janitor, another person who said, oh yes, it's over there in that room, and uh, she sends in a picture of it. This is a very different kind of investigative reporting because as it turned out, that is, is very likely a breach of what a charity is supposed to do. But uh, David Farenthold would probably not have had the time as a single reporter to go through all of those steps. But enlisting other people, as we see, uh, is, is another new step. The, uh, uh, Bob Schieffer also talked about the role of fake stories, uh, fake news, as people have been talking about it. And there is, there is no doubt that there are often at least three major reasons. One uh, is fake news is put out for profit. Uh, many of you may recall the story of the Macedonian teenagers who found in particular, if it was a story about Trump or that involved Trump uh, and was seen as negative to Hillary Clinton, they got, more, uh, they got more advertising money because it got more hits on Facebook and, and elsewhere. And then there appears to have been, and I think this is what Hillary Clinton was talking about when she talked about the 1,000 Russian agents, because of the... Of, of the robotics and the algorithms, a sophisticated influence operation can put out a sizable amount of news. Now, take one for instance. The Pope endorses Donald Trump. Big surprise. Pope rarely endorses anybody. Very unlikely that the Pope, with his social views, would endorse Donald Trump. But because it's such a surprise, and news to some extent is about surprise, it spreads, and if you push it, it spreads even more. And this is something that will, uh, will in fact, uh, be a major issue. Because what we have done is we have gone from the gatekeeper world, and that was the, the world very much as I entered it uh, in the late 1960s uh, as at the Washington Post. I was hired by Ben Bradley, whose name some of you may remember as the editor during the Watergate uh, period in Washington. And in that era, 25 men and one woman, Catherine Graham, who owned the Washington Post, controlled 80% of the news flow and what was news and the public conversation in America. It was three TV networks, three or four major papers. There were things called news magazines in those days. Uh, the news magazines are almost gone, but Time magazine used to be a giant of the earth. David, maybe you, do you remember when that, when that happened? At any, I know Congressman Bonker does. Uh, in any case, uh, that changed uh, beginning in the mid-90s and the Tower of Babel world, which we are now in, accelerated greatly in the last five years so that the phone, which you have in your hand, some of you literally right now, is more powerful than a Cray supercomputer was 30 years ago. You are able to reach the whole world. You are able to send things. It's okay. I, I would be looking at mine if I were listening to me too. Um, and the... Uh, the, the fact is that this uh, has made not just a flat world, but a world with enormous divisions, great opportunities, great problems. So at this point, uh, since I was given the title of 500 years of news reporting, I'm going to very briefly go over it because I'd much rather talk about it, and I think you'd probably more, more likely when I asked questions about the last five months. In fact, my wife, who's an emergency room doctor, said, you're talking about the last 500 years. You barely made it through the last 50 years. If I hadn't been here, I said, I know, honey. I know, you kept me going all this time. That's huge mortgage payments, oh Lord. Um, but uh, I think we can see a number of our current dilemmas in the past. And it is interesting because I think the through line is human psychology, which although our technology has changed, human psychology doesn't change a whole lot. I uh, talked 
recently with uh, one of the biographers of Lyndon Johnson, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Some of you may know her work. She's done a number of good works. And she had been reading the Iliad, and she said, everything I need to know about the Lyndon Johnson White House is very much in the Iliad, quarreling, powerful men, complaints over the, uh, uh, the disposition of the troops, the, the division of spoils, and by that, what she meant and what I'm talking about is that human psychology does not change a lot. Uh, there is another line that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And that uh, we see because the first fake news was not, uh, you know, the first time Google uh, put up a post. The first fake news, just for a start, is what the Romans would put up on papyruses on the forum. Uh, they were interested in two things, divorce and crime. Does this sound familiar to any readers of the Daily Mail? We are interested in these things because of our evolutionary psychology. Are we interested in conspiracies? Sure. Why is that? Because we have pattern-seeking minds. We are the descendants of the people who would see folks coming over the hill and would have to decide, does it look like they are people who want to trade with us or does it look like they're people who want to kill us? We are descendants of the people who guessed right most of the time and had to guess right very quickly. So we make patterns. How are they coming at us? What are they doing? That is why, uh, in fact, what news often is, some, some of, one of its uh, problems is that we sometimes fall into uh, traps of saying this thing is like that thing because it looks sort of like it. The Romans uh, did that. The Chinese, interestingly, were not among the first to have newspapers. They did have a court chronicle uh, well over a thousand plus years ago, but didn't have newspapers. They're generally first in everything, but didn't have newspapers until 19th century missionaries introduced them to the idea. The first newspaper that we count was produced in Strasbourg, Germany by Johann Carolus in 1605. And uh, interestingly, uh, and this is a, a motif that goes through all of the cycles of news technologies, he wanted a monopoly. He would like to have been in charge, the only person who had that. And as in all the history of media, new forms come along. So by 16, and competitors come along whenever the cost of entry gets smaller. So by 1620, the first English newspapers were being produced, not in London, but in Amsterdam. And the and French language newspapers were produced there too. That was very much part of the gatekeeper world. If you look back at some of the newspapers, they were very much like blogs today. People uh, printed often one and two man things in the American colonies. Uh, uh, another interesting thing happened, uh, a very influential essay by a British writer named Cato said, truth should be the defense against libel. And that particular idea caught on with the American founders so that when in later, uh, 50 years later, they were founding America, they decided that the reason the First Amendment had to be there, the only constitutionally protected uh, profession, was that there needed to be a watchdog on government. For people to feel that they were governed correctly, the news media had that role. Now, sometimes, of course, Many times it has fallen short of that or gone beyond it. Sometimes it has seemed like an attack dog uh, <clears throat> to people who were trying to govern with good intentions. Sometimes it has seemed to others like it's a lap dog, ready to trade good coverage for access. But in fact, the, uh, the First Amendment was set to throw off the yoke of the British. I apologize to my our British friends here, but the Crown uh, if you said the wrong thing, worshiped the wrong way, printed the wrong thing, you could lose your house, you could lose your head, and they wanted that to go the other way. Uh, and interestingly, and I'm going to read these quotes, Thomas Jefferson, of course, one of the America's great founders, I'll tell you a little story about him and the press, 
uh, while he didn't write the First Amendment, one of his disciples uh, did, uh, the Bill of Rights it's called, and uh, Jefferson uh, was one of those who said famously, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate to prefer the latter. Now that's often quoted at lovely panels, but gambling on a free press is not always a happy experience. Here are a couple of Jefferson quotes you won't hear so often. In, seven, in 1807, after his affair with his slave, Sally Hemings, which I'll explain in a minute, was brooded about in the press, Jefferson said, nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious when in this polluted vehicle. And by 1814, after he, was, he had retired from the presence, he said, I deplore the putrid state into which our newspapers have passed and the malignity, the vulgarity, and mendacious spirit of those who write for them. Now, you want to hear a little background on that story? So, in fact, the newspapers, for all the wonderful ideas the Founding Fathers had about them, to be a watchdog on the government, they very quickly fell into being partisan vehicles. There was one man in particular named James Callender who was allied with Jefferson's party, and he was known as the Muckraker. These were small newspapers, and at one point he wrote a story about the sensational love affair that Alexander Hamilton had fallen into. You've heard of the Hamilton, uh, the Hamilton play that is very famous now. And Hamilton, actually, uh, th there were some circumstances to it. He had fallen in uh, with a woman who was not his wife. And then about six weeks later, her, uh, her husband arrived and said, oh, I'm outraged. And Hamilton had to pay him off. Now, the rumor was, which he always denied and for which there's no proof, was that he had manipulated the bond market. And so Hamilton, astonishingly, wrote a lengthy apology and declaration to the American public saying, yes, I did too have sex with that woman, Maria Reynolds, but I did not manipulate the bond market. That was the thing that drove him crazy. So that passes into the background, but Calendar expects some sort of reward from Jefferson's party. In point of fact, he did not get the postmastership, which was a lucrative position, and he felt cheated on that. And then he remembered some rumors that he had heard. While he had been imprisoned under the Alien and Sedition Act, which was possibly our greatest threat to the First Amendment, which said that any, any stories which hurt the government uh, could land you in prison. This was under John Adams. And to give a little background, the government felt very fragile. This, after all, we had just gotten our independence and we were still almost in a state of war with England. While, he, while Callender was in prison, he had heard rumors that Jefferson at his uh, at his estate in Monticello nearby had several children by a woman named Sally Hemings. And so he decided to write it as his revenge. He wrote it in 1802 and the country blew up. Now, we were hearing from Giles about how to handle crises. Let's see how this goes. Thomas Jefferson said nothing. There were, uh, it, was such a, it was such a widespread scandal that there was even a song written about it uh, to the tune of Yankee Doodle Dandy, forgive my musicality, uh, when from the affairs of state I seek release, I want to sport and dally, I find my sweet release in the lap of Sally. Pretty bad for the time. Okay, take my word for it. Jefferson says nothing about it. And then it, uh, life goes on, and he is, in fact, reelected. But 
It was a way of showing that the difficulties in the free press that the, uh, that the founders had set up were by no means all easily surmountable. And that has continued to be an element in America, that you can write, and if people don't like it, they can write other things. The cure for bad speech is more speech. In, uh, as the industrial age went on in the 1850s, more papers spread to big cities, uh, but uh, the other, uh, the next great change uh, came about, interestingly, because of the Russians in 1917. After the Bolshevik Revolution, the Russians spread propaganda. They wanted to make communism uh, a, a world-dominating ideology, and were coming closer than you might expect in some quarters in America. At that point, a major American journalist, Walter Lippmann, decided we need to, we need to change how newspapers are doing things. They shouldn't just be uh, uh, vehicles for one party's side or another. We should report the news, it's different from the editorial pages, report the news and show how it's done. And so he took the idea of scientific method, which says if you put chemical A with chemical B, and you will reach with that combination 105 degrees centigrade. If I show you how to do that, and you too put them together and reach 105 degrees centigrade, my theory is right. That is scientific method. You've shown objectively that it can be replicated. What Libman was upset about was that reporters were going and falling in love with the Russian Revolution, which was, I've seen the future and it works, and uh, inspired by the idealism, were were taking wholeheartedly what the Bolshevik government was saying. He said, no, we have to imitate the elements of the sciences by saying, how did we get our information, put it together, together, give the context, give the way it fits together, show your logic, be as transparent as you can be. And interestingly, it is that that David Farenthold is getting back to when he asks people, he says, I've heard this about Trump's portrait, now help me find this, and then, and then put it back together. In the 1930s, radio uh, became uh, much more dominant, but did not kill off newspapers. There is, this, there is a strength in newspapers. Television, likewise, was supposed to kill off newspapers in America, did not, although it changed the number of afternoon newspapers. But it also put a vast, put a sizable premium on the speed of news. One of the more poignant things that I recall in 1979 during the Iranian hostage crisis in which America's diplomats were taken hostage in Tehran uh, for over 400 days, uh, the, and Jimmy Carter's presidency itself was in some ways held hostage, and his counsel uh, said, looking at the television cameras arrayed across the White House lawn said, our difficulty is we have to give those guys something to say at 5.30 every evening. Well, you know, that not that long ago, 1979, 37, uh, 38 years ago, and now, of course, you have to feed the beast every, every 10 seconds, much less at the end of every day. Uh, cable television changed uh, the equation, too, because that brought 24-hour news. In 91, it came of age. Uh, I was honored as a CNN alumnus to hear Giles say that BBC and CNN are, in many ways, the gold standard on international reporting. But it was the Gulf War that brought CNN uh, to the fore. <coughs> However, satellites proliferated. It wasn't, there was no monopoly. And so a relatively few years later, Hezbollah has its own satellite channel. Now everyone has their own satellite channels. And likewise, uh, we, get into, um, uh, we get into a world where, like the O.J. Simpson story, which also took place in Los Angeles when I was there, a saga 
uh, uh, television uh, channels look for sagas that have long ongoing things. For those who aren't familiar, O.J. Simpson was one of the greatest American athletes, football player. Uh, after he became an actor and after his career was over, during a messy breakup with his wife, he became jealous and was accused, but acquitted, uh, of killing her, although the judgment of history is not going on his side. Uh, but that became another thing that news programs were looking for. Remember, like the Romans, divorce and crime. That's what the O.J. Simpson story had, but it's a variation on it, and it kept attention. And if you go to CNN, they have a chart on the wall, utterly fascinating and quite uh, in newsroom dark humor, and it's called the, the Chart of Human Progress. And it shows the ratings of CNN, which bubble along down here, and big things are happening, presidential elections, stock market crashes in 87, and so on, it bubbles along that. And then all of a sudden, it goes up 10x, 20x, to a huge plateau, and goes across, for, and then it goes right back down. Meanwhile, following on some big things, that was the year of O.J. Simpson. CNN's ratings went through the roof, and so did the other networks that did it. And that's why we now, to this day, see a tremendous amount of pursuit uh, of that. But with the spread of other satellites, and especially with the internet in the late 1990s, uh, you now have a variety of voices. And also what came in is what I call the age of instant scandal. Some of you may recall Monica Lewinsky. Uh, I was at ABC News when, uh, and supervised her interview with Barbara Walters. So now, roughly, not quite 20 years later, she gave a TED talk, uh, which interestingly I happened to be there for as well. And she said, I was patient zero in the age of internet bullying. And it's true, in late 98, suddenly this went much more around the world. Her face was known, it wasn't. Uh, and uh, she then goes into some of the effects uh, of that. She has never found a guy, really. Uh, she's never been able to have a business. It was not a self-pitying speech. And for those of you who are interested, I recommend that you read it. Uh, she said, the difficulty is what guy wants to say, uh, who are you dating now? Oh, Monica Lewinsky. Uh, she said, she said she was, I believe, 42 when she gave it. And she said, you may not believe this, but I was recently hit on by a 27-year-old guy. And she still looks uh, quite good but, and slimmer and very pretty uh, 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 skin and hair. And she said, uh, so I told him, you know, I'm 40 years old. And he said, I'm going to make you feel like you're 22 again. And she said, I am possibly the only woman in America who does not want to feel like she's 22 again, who's <laughs> over 40, because she was being dragged through the mud. And um, it, uh, uh, the reason why she did it was also fascinating. There had been... Uh, a few of you may recall about five years ago, a college student in New York, where she lives now, uh, named Tyler Clemente, was experimenting with his sexual leanings, and he thought he might be homosexual, and he decided to arrange uh, a visit to his dorm room. He had a roommate, who I guess thought he was a prankster, but this went far beyond that, who set up a camera uh, an internet camera to get this and then directly put it onto the internet. Tyler Clemente was so abashed and so ashamed that he threw himself off the George Washington Bridge. And Monica Lewinsky said, I had post-traumatic stress disorder with that and so did my mother because during the worst of her periods, she said her mother would not allow her to sleep by herself. She set up a cot by her bed. She would not allow her to go into the bathroom without leaving the, the door open at all times. And so she wanted to speak uh, 
to the people who are being bullied. This is by no means the only story, but it is the flip side of this wonderful thing we carry in our pocket. There was one other interesting gatekeeper episode during that period uh, when I was at ABC News. Uh, you, some of you may recall Bill Clinton had to testify before a grand jury, which had come and taken DNA from him. Can you imagine? Well, now we can. Um, and so it was, uh, it had been taped, and they call it broadcast live to tape. And it was going to be shown live on television, though it had taken place a couple of days before. And the rumor was that Bill Clinton had become furious during this, shouted some blue words, thrown off his mic, stormed out of the uh, grand jury testimony, and, uh, and only then had been convinced to come back. So we decided, uh-oh, because at ABC, we are controlled by the Federal Communications Commission. So you cannot broadcast the seven terrible words, which we thought he had probably, one, one or two of which we thought he had probably said. So uh, they, they said, well, somebody has to be downstairs and, and hit the control button to censor it. And I was a new guy, and foolishly, before I knew what had happened, I suddenly had been nominated as the guy to go down there and do it. I don't want you all to laugh, especially you, Congressman Bonker, but I was in charge of standards and practices. That is the ethics czar. Some of you are cracking a smile. I don't like that either. Um, and so I started to go down, and we said, well, we'll have a 10-second delay. Well, I could, I could do that. As I was going downstairs, they called on my cell phone and said, it's going to be a five-second delay. I get into the control room, and it's just me and a techie and the button. And he says, oh, by the way, they want a three-second delay. I said, now, now I'm worried because you're, you're stuck. And I thought, it's one of those things, how did I ever get in this place? Because if he does say some of these horrible things and I let it go through, we may wind up in front of the FCC. My poor mother, who's just very happy I'm at ABC, uh, is going to hear these horrible words and be embarrassed to the ground. And on the other hand, if I censor them, and you know cable doesn't have to, cable ha lives under different standards, then they'll run it, and then I'm part of the media conspiracy to cover up Bill Clinton's bad acts. And so nothing good was going to happen with this. And finally, after four hours of testimony, it turned out the whole thing was kind of a fraud. The White House had set us up by saying that, that Clinton had said these bad words. So in the expectations game, which Giles would probably would be able to explain to us, Clinton didn't do as badly as, as people thought he would. And the, uh, uh, the one other gatekeeper story worth uh, telling you was we had the last interview with Osama bin Laden that a Westerner had in 1998. And here, the streaming media saved us because our reporter had gone up. We only brought in, into the hills of Afghanistan to be with this raggedy guy. Remember, it's 1998, but nobody knows who he is. And, uh, and he wants to declare war on America. So we run some elements of that, and people didn't react. In fact, I'll give a $20 prize to anybody who even says they remember that 1998 interview. I barely remember it. But uh, the, uh, the reporter, John Miller, uh, who later joined the FBI, came and said, by the way, the, there's one group that is extremely interested and they want all of it. Uh, these are the, this was the FBI. Now, we have a, that gives us another kind of problem in journalism in America because we don't turn over notes and film that we don't publish to police forces. And the reason for that is we don't want to be seen as arms of the state because we may, that may get us in more pr trouble if we interview someone who is, you know, for example, a terrorist uh, who might say, well, you're part of the state. So we have a problem. Uh, reporters have gone to jail rather than turn these out. What can we do? 
And after uh, two Vinties at Starbucks, we came up with a solution. That was, if you remember that, that saying we said, the, the cure for bad speech is more speech. I said, what if we began, this was just the streaming video came in, what if we began to broadcast pieces of those four hours on our overnight broadcasts and on streaming video, therefore, then we can say it has all been published, it's all in the public, and we gave them to the FBI. And were we ever glad we did? Because imagine what would have happened if we had been holding on to those after 2001. There is one slightly amusing coda to that. Uh, eight years later, uh, John joined the FBI as their assistant director for communications. To do that, you have to be what they call fluttered. You have to take a lie detector test. And so John, a very smart alecky New Yorker, is there, and the, uh, the uh, interrogator says, uh, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? No. Have you ever given away state secrets? No. Have you ever met with the terrorist group? Yes. Which terrorist group? Al-Qaeda? Who in Al-Qaeda? Osama bin Laden and I'm in al-Zawahiri. <laughs> Get the bleep out. <laughs> and John, as only a smart alecky New Yorker would, says, are we still on the test? No, <laughs> says the guy. Nevertheless, he did get in. And so in that case, uh, a gatekeeper was able to find the right way. But Moore's law has changed all of this. And I, and I mention this because it's going to keep changing and you young people in the audience are going to have an extraordinary life. Moore's law, begun about 50 years ago by Gordon Moore, one of the heads of Intel, which makes a lot of the computer chips, uh, was that every 18 months, the power of technology grows, and grows 100%, and the, and the cost of it goes down 50%. So if you look at how long that's been going, you now see why you have the speed of change now with mobile and social media just in five to eight years. Let me give you one example which directly affects uh, the news world. Google, you may recall, well, uh, I'll put it this way. The daughter of a Stanford professor named Susan Mojiski had a garage, and a couple of grad students wanted to work out in the garage. They had an idea of making a taxonomy of the world's knowledge and make it so you could easily get to the world's knowledge. Doesn't sound to me like it's going to make 10 cents, but she rents it to them. And she starts helping them. And fairly soon, her sister comes over. Now, in this case, it's the mother of these two girls that I know. Uh, and the daughter who rented them is named Susan Mojiski. She became head of advertising for their company, which turned out to be called Google. And the other sister married one of the founders, Sergey Brin. Uh, that you would see in your, the listings of one of your sponsors here in Forbes, uh, worth $40 billion. Uh, Susan herself, as head of advertising, did one thing which uh, led to a chart that I will give you is the, the final chart that is the example that shows the shift in the world. It shows that in 2006, American newspapers in their advertising had $55 billion. That was all in the very top, and that was the highest it ever got. By 2012, that had been cut in half to $27 billion. Meanwhile, Google, which had only started in the very late 90s, I think 98, 99, in 2012, just one arrow, 60 B for billion dollars in advertising, meaning that in those 13, 14 years, it had surpassed in advertising revenue the entire American newspaper uh, combination in total. And that 
is the world that is changing now. Google and Facebook are taking considerably more of the new advertising. There is a, there is a, uh, a size issue. Uh, luckily, interestingly, Susan Wojcicki's mother, Esther, is uh, a friend of mine. She is on the board of the museum. And what she has been doing with her whole career, which has been as a teacher of journalism at Palo Alto High School, is teaching critical thinking uh, to young students. She says, I'm not trying to make a, a new crop of journalists. I'm trying to make a great set of citizens. And this, I think, is the most important thing. If there's one thing I could leave people with, it is that, you know, what is a cure for fake news? There, there's several elements that can be, but the cure on an individual basis, both personally and, I would say, socially, is to help teach children as young as fifth grade and on how to tell fact from fiction, learning how to estimate what kind of sources you're using, being careful about it, what stands to reason, what's the track record. There, uh, at the museum, we have education classes in this. We reach uh, not quite 10 million students in America. I'm hoping someday, because if I ruled the world, I would say that the most important thing for self-governance in democratic countries, not just America, is the ability of the citizen to know what the world is like. That's what news does. It tells you, new, it tells you what the world is. At one end, what's most important. At the other end, what's just interesting. At one end, about nuclear proliferation. At the other end, what Kim Kardashian did last night for those who are interested. And hey, she's an LA lady, so I, I still have a slight rooting interest for her. And as a result, that issue is where we find ourselves now. And that world is being fought out in Washington with a new administration. It is being fought out now in Germany, where interestingly, Facebook, uh, the other giant, which uh, says we we basically facilitate conversations among people. We let people share news, but obviously that is wide open uh, to people who, for propaganda reasons or for their own self-interest, want to inject fake news into the system. Uh, uh, Facebook is ha has had to hire over 700 reviewers in Germany. Uh, as Germany is coming up on an election, a great fear that there can be changes there. They are also facing potential multi-million dollar fines if hate news, as they define it there, has come up. And so we end with the modest irony that in the country where newspapers began, in the gatekeeper world there in Strasbourg, Germany, with Johannes Carroll looking for a monopoly, you have Facebook, which is not trying to be a monopoly, but is certainly very big, having to uh, wage uh, another and newer front in the endless quest to try to figure out what the news of the world is. So I'll stop there, and I thank you very much for your time. Be glad to take questions. We have, thank you very much. Just sorry. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, got it. Sorry. Мы в Азии чуть-чуть по-иному воспринимаем демократию, мало про нее знаем, поэтому у меня вопрос по первой части. Я хотел узнать, довольны ли вы демократией в США? так как вы не воспринимаете избрание президента Трампа. И, по-моему, это вам не нравится. И нужна ли такая демократия, когда к власти приходит такой человек? Потому что, судя по вашим словам, демократия больше игра эмоций американцев, в результате чего он пришел к власти. И есть такое расхожее сравнение, что в Америке больше правит не президент, а Уолл-стрит. 
И можно ли сегодня это говорить? И третий, последний вопрос. В Америке в последнее время, последние несколько лет, стало традицией, что республиканцы и демократы правят по два срока. У господина Трампа будет такая возможность? Спасибо. Very good questions. Uh, on the second question, if I knew for sure you and I could make a lot of money on, uh, on the bets on that in London, uh, I would say that I never predict on American elections because many things come into play. I would also say that uh, when, when I was talking about other people and their reactions uh, to Trump, those are not mine. I am an analyst. I'm an old-style uh, newsman in this sense. I believed in aiming for objectivity because, in, in no small part because my grandfather was a U.S. senator, and so I'm very aware of the tendency uh, that we in the press, and I have been part of them, but I'm not always the same as other people. The press is a multi, multi-headed, thousand-headed beast. Um, but there is a tendency to either see a person as a villain or as a saint. And it is important to understand and to analyze coolly. I think I also mentioned that my wife is an emergency room doctor and I've learned from her over the years that the important thing is to view hot situations with cool analysis. For example, when she has people coming into the emergency room who've been shot in gang shootings as we had in Los Angeles, it was very important that she stay cool but also know exactly how bad it was and how bad it was seen. So likewise, uh, when there is political uh, unrest and emotion, I find it interesting to analyze. And uh, the, uh, you mentioned, does that mean democracy is wrong because uh, a person like Trump comes in? No. Uh, there are many people, many millions of people who voted for him. They were in the right places. It was our system. And likewise, you could have said, you know, there were a number of people, millions, who were unhappy that Barack Obama was elected. But that is the nature of the democracy, that you get your chance uh, to go ahead for your person. It is by no means a perfect system. Uh, uh, Winston Churchill said, in times of confusion, return to first principles. And the first principle of democracy is that people have a way of being represented. America is by no means the only, the only system for democracy. We set up, uh, as I mentioned, an argument society, a marketplace of ideas. So that means there will always be a certain number of people whose ideas weren't accepted, who are unhappy. Now, uh, the point I was trying to make, perhaps not well enough, was that with the social media, it is hard because everyone can express him or herself at length, out loud, and two sizable studies of internet usage, both in China and America within the last several years, have shown that anger is a dominant emotion of many people on the internet, both countries. So the, uh, you have to take that into account. Uh, another thing Churchill said, reflecting one of the Greek philosophers, was uh, democracy is the worst system there is except for all the others. And that is uh, worth pondering. Like all aphorisms, it has an element of truth to it and only goes so far. But uh, the, the, difficulty with other, the difficulties with other systems probably better for a, a political uh, political science uh, colloquy, but I want to get to other people. But does that answer your questions as you wish them, sir? Partially. Okay. We'll talk further afterwards.
uh, second term for Trump, uh, not impossible. Uh, but uh, here, here's why. Here's why nobody can say, and everyone is anxious as uh, an old Texas phrase, nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. If you can translate that, I will give you another $20. <laughs> um, and, and that is uh, another way of viewing the human brain is that we have a thousand little future scenario machines inside our brain. And there's, they're each is trying to run a simulation about something as simple as, should I have a sip of Coke? Or should I invest in the stock market in techs uh, for a 10-year thing so my retirement will be set? All of our little future scenario machines, when it comes to politics, presidential politics in the U.S., have been thrown into a state of confusion by Trump's election. He was seen as an outsider. He ran against 15 other, many of them well-qualified, standard-issue Republican candidates. He runs against, and, and somehow wins. He runs against the vaunted Clinton political machine uh, Hillary Clinton had in, in her husband, arguably one of the best political advisors in America. And, and yet he, he wins. And as a consequence, even though he has a special counsel, even though he has Washington on a hubbub, uh, recent polls have shown he still has strong support among his base and among Republicans generally. So he has, uh, he also has the question, the issue of unpredictability. Uh, as we see uh, in, in Giles' uh, excellent presentation, he talked about the possibility of putting out another story, maybe a positive story, while there's a gap in the news coverage. Uh, President Trump uh, often seems to, uh, when uh, people are outraged, he will say another amazing thing on Twitter, and everybody rushes over uh, to see about that, and it may be uh, equally unsettling to the status quo. I think the real question is going to be, how does he deliver economically? Uh, because that generally is the issue. He's talked about these jobs. I think Americans generally give a new president uh, the first year to two years, and then they, they want to start seeing some results. So that's one question. The other question always is, of what are known as the black swan. Uh, and I tend to think of those more from overseas. Uh, that is, uh, who would have guessed that George Bush, for example, George W. Bush, when he became president, uh, he said he wanted to have a humble foreign policy. He wanted to concentrate on America. We shouldn't be so involved in things. Then comes 9-11, a black swan event. And for those of you who, uh, weren't philosophy majors, the black swan is uh, based on the idea that uh, the, the syllogism about uh, all, you know, swans are white uh, and therefore all swans must be white. So here comes a black swan and, and it changes your idea, your paradigm of thinking on that. So we could face that. Uh, I was with actually a guy who's a, a, an eminent West Coast futurist uh, this, this past week, and we were discussing what could the black swans be, and he said, well, you know, what if, uh, what if a major company, country collapses, uh, uh, one that's close to America, or what if uh, there is another major attack uh, within America? That, those are ones we can, uh, we, we can imagine, but in fact could happen. So how he would respond to that would also have potentially a very big effect. In short, uh, there, there is no real way of knowing, and anybody who tells you that is uh, probably just fooling himself or herself. Yes, sir. Thank you, Shelby. Um, in the spirit of um, media training in Kazakhstan, 
Um, I thought I could uh, speak maybe as a um, um, Kazakh for a second. Uh, thank you like so that. much for your for all those comments. But I was going to. Uh, I wanted to say that if you're um, if you work for a Kazakh uh, news uh, agency, a newspaper, a radio station, or a, set, a website, and you do not uh, use the opportunity to um, try to interview and talk extensively with this man while he is here, it would be an example of the missed opportunity of access to content. But I think we could go further. Too kind. I th no, but I think that is kind. really important because there's an issue here. People are listening to you and they're interested and they're fascinated, but they should be thinking about how your words could resonate with their readers. And, I was, and we could go beyond that. Um, what about a, co a column uh, called uh, The Gatekeeper, uh, which is about media stories inside the country? Or you could even call it something like The uh, Thousand-Headed Beast, uh, which is about the way you, the way you described, um, you know, um, uh, uh, media and um, and or a or an ongoing show about the ability of citizens to know. And lastly, uh, as the vice chair of Newseum, um, why doesn't Kazakhstan have its version of uh, Newseum? And would you be willing to help and di dialogue or consult with somebody locally who wanted to set up um, the? contemporary history of Kazakhstan's uh, press and media. And if I'd you be, say yes, then somebody should act on it. Today. I'd be greatly honored to. We, we love doing that. And thank you for a very nice summary. Much appreciated. All right. I think we're almost at the witching hour, but Don Bonkra, as always, gets the last word. Anybody, this is the guy you really want to talk to. He's seen it all. Oh, thank you, Shelby. Um, you know, there's an amazing contrast in modern time when, on the one hand, you have Vladimir Putin, President Nazarbayev, uh, President Xi in China, all with very high positive ratings, 80 percent plus. Uh, American political leaders all have extremely low uh, polling numbers. Congress down to about 16 percent, Trump at uh, 33, 35 percent. And of course, the contrast is whether or not the government can control the media and assure that there's no negative reporting versus in a democracy where there's no check on media coverage. When I go online and look at the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, all the major publications, I would say 80 percent of the headlines on Trump are negative. Now, he invites a lot of that. But I wonder if that undermines democracy, if that the media coverage is so negative, if that's what is cultivating uh, people's attitudes about our government. But on the other hand, to have a government control the media, then there's no accountability. There's huge corruption, but nobody knows about it. So in today's modern society, how do we find the balance between media report, uh, reporting on political leaders that is uh, forthright and uh, unbiased, that helps to inform uh, voters, enhance the political standing of the institution, versus just absolute control of media? Is there a balance, or are we just going in these two directions forever. You have asked the, the million dollar question, and it is uh, different countries will have different answers on that. I think in, because of where I grew up and how I have worked, I agree with Churchill that the free press is the guardian of all other rights that free men prize. And 
Yet, uh, as, as you say it, I am also aware of another thing philosophers say, that a, a fish is not aware that it's swimming in water. This is the water I swam in, and so I believe that dialogue, even disagreement, unhappiness uh, with a ruling class isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. Uh, there, there are many things in life we're not terribly happy with, but are better than the others. And I think that is uh, what a free press ultimately is. But it is, uh, I, I admit fully, a biased choice. Yes, sir. Shelby, great yeah. talk. Um, just to, I just wanted to add to this conversation and, 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 and then uh, end with a question. Do you think in, in an age where people can um, become a journalist at the uh, click of a tweet button yes. or a post button, that it is possible in the modern world to control the media? And if we can't, isn't that actually one of the biggest challenges uh, present, that it certainly will present itself to um, media that has traditionally been controlled and to politicians that have traditionally had the ability to control the media in that now they're going to have to learn to rebut and to answer questions that potentially in the past they wouldn't have had to necessarily uh, answer in such a public forum. Absolutely right. That's another of the great dilemmas. One of the things that was in the early days, uh, the tech triumphalism was going to be that, uh, that in fact, all of the conversation are, uh, in different countries was going to make it more, uh, the governments would have to be more responsive. The Chinese, for one, have erected what they call, what is called the Great Firewall. And so you have a sizable amount of cat and mouse uh, between uh, people uh, speaking more openly in ways that are seen as problematic by the government and being pulled off the internet. I think that cat and mouse game will continue and not just necessarily for democracy but there's also a sizable issue on terrorists are putting their messages in, encoded, going to the dark web. And uh, Facebook, in fact, uh, just yesterday announced new ways in which they are going to use artificial intelligence to try to take down terrorist messages. It is like so many human institutions, the, the great things that technology gives us, more expression, uh, able to, uh, to be in conversation with somebody halfway around the world that fast, also brings the other side, and it is the nature of human nature. Uh, Immanuel Kant said, nothing straight ever comes out of the crooked timber of humanity. I'll end with that. Immanuel Kant, come on, Shall that's we? not so Shall bad. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, Giles has a, oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, I've got two questions for you. Do you think uh, with the fragmentation of the media that journalistic standards have fallen over the past sort of 10, 15 years, and also, do you think that Trump gets an easy ride from the American media? Because from my perspective, looking from the UK, it seems like no one has actually worked out how to deal with him and properly hold him to account. Um, first one, journalistic standards. I would say, broadly speaking, you, you have to separate out the mainstream media by which we mean the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, a number of other papers that are trying to do serious coverage. And I would say probably to the contrary, not without exceptions, uh, that there's a lot of very high quality journalism being done, maybe more, in part because of the tools of big data and other things make stories that in the past would have been conceptually interesting but impossible to get the data for possible. Uh, and uh, for example, I'll just give one example, uh, the number of homicides by police had never been kept until uh, uh, nationally in America until several years ago with a couple of publicized shootings, newspapers uh, started trying to do that and get that. So you can, you can do more things now. 
I think the reason it seems as if standards have slipped is because more people, every man a publisher, every woman a broadcaster, more people can insert themselves into the world as it is. And uh, people may call them citizen journalists, but most of them are not. Uh, the, Walt Mossberg, who runs a big tech conference, said, do you like citizen journalists? How do you like citizen surgeons? Uh, meaning, you don't want that. Uh, and there takes, uh, to do high quality journalism, you do need training, you do need experience. Uh, on the uh, second one, has Trump gotten an easy ride? I think, I would say not. I know certainly that he feels not, and I talk to people who, ha who talk with him some, and his, uh, he has a sense of grievance. He, does, he, he feels that he didn't collude with the Russians, and you, you may notice in James Comey's interesting reminiscence of his discussions, if, if some people around me were doing the wrong things, fine. Uh, and uh, Comey, a very interesting figure, and I will say, a uh, point of personal, uh, personal uh, feeling, uh, he's, he's, uh, we have the FBI exhibit at the museum, and I've introduced him a couple of times, and I think he is a very interesting guy with, with real integrity, despite having irritated people on both sides of the aisle, and Robert Mueller uh, likewise. Uh, so I think that the uh, the interesting question that some of the people who really can't stand Trump is, well, why hasn't any newspaper brought him to ground? He, he, keeps, uh, he keeps going on. Well, that's, that is uh, the nature of the powers of the presidency. He is a person also with quite an acute sense of what uh, he can aim people at. He is not, uh, he's not uh, not a shrewd guy. He's a very shrewd guy. So the, the question of how this is going to turn out, I think, fascinates everyone. It's an amazing story with, bi with big, uh, uh, very big consequences. But I would, not, uh, I would not say that the press, in fact, I can speak from the newsrooms of the Washington Post and the New York Times and others, uh, they feel like they are doing a strong, important job uh, trying to be, uh, trying to run down everything. I think, last point on it, there are so many elements uh, to be looked at. For example, we are told, but do not know uh, that uh, for absolute certain that the special counsel is looking into Jared Kushner's business dealings and there are other Trump business dealings. I'm sure uh, other editors and journalists in here looking at that would have said long ago, that's an, that's an interesting area. I'd like to know more about that. So we're, I think we're still in the first chapter, although it seems like a, a quite an eventful first chapter of this presidency. And it, uh, we, could, uh, you know, we could be here in seven years as Trump is, uh, heading off into the gloaming after a highly successful, economically robust uh, seven years and say, boy, that, that first year was a little tough, but who knows? Then again, destiny always has surprises in store, and that is the greatest pleasure of the news business. History is full of surprises. We do history on the run, and I can't wait to see what comes next. I thank you all so much for coming. Great seeing you.